and welcome to episode 20 of Board Game Blitz, a podcast about all things board games that you can listen to in less time than it takes to get a table for two at a restaurant on a Friday night. Honey, I told you to make a reservation! This week's theme is two-player games. We'll be discussing games we've played recently like Rolling Stock, Power Grid Deluxe, and Lotus. We'll then be talking about some of our favorite two-player games. And finally, we look into the etymology of the word alliance. And now, here are your hosts, Ambi. Cassidy and me Crystal. So as many of you probably already know by now but maybe not all of you uh, if you don't follow us on social media which by the way you should be following us on social (laughs) media uh, we are super happy to announce that we are now a member of the Dice Tower Network which is the largest online network of board game podcasts that exists in the whole world, <laughs> to our knowledge. <laughs> and we wanted to thank uh, Tom Vassell, who is the head of the Dice Tower, for including us in the network. There are a lot of really wonderful podcasts that cover a whole bunch of different topics, uh, mostly board games, but there's also some that discuss things that are not board games in their episodes as well. And every type of board game that you can imagine played by every type of person you can imagine. There are a lot of wonderful shows there. And we are honored to be one of those now. So, yay, we're super excited. (laughs) Yay! (laughs) So you will be potentially hearing uh, from other Dice Tower shows. Like, we might be giving some shout outs to some of the other shows in the network. You know, we want to try and lift up the people that are helping us out. And you might hear from us in some of the other Dice Tower shows in the future as well. Who knows? Uh, The sky's the limit. And we're just super excited to be part of a cool group of content creators. All right, Ambi. So what games have you been playing recently? Recently, I've been playing a lot of Rolling Stock, which is an 18xx inspired economic card game. It doesn't have trains or track. It was made in 2011 by Bjorn Robinstein. It's three to five players, and our group can play it in about two to three hours. In Rolling Stock, players auction for private companies, which at the beginning, there are simple train companies, but then as the game goes on, it goes through different eras and the companies become more modernized. And so at the end of the game, there's like airports and space stations, but the companies are just cards uh, and they're actual, like, real companies that existed. I don't know any of them, but they are. And <laughs> throughout the game, players decide to convert private companies into public companies with an IPO. And when a company becomes public, other players can buy shares in the company. And there's r- greater reward because the corporation, if the corporation has a high valuation, the stock can go up. But also the stock can go down if it doesn't. Corporations have higher earning potential than individuals because there's a rule that when corporations have certain sets of private companies, they collect the bonus income from synergies. So there's a lot of thinking about which private companies you want in a corporation because some are more valuable depending on what you already have. In rolling stock, the stock market is pretty intricate. So a cool part about it is whenever you buy a share, the price goes up, but you have to buy at the more expensive price and vice versa for selling a share. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so there's pretty interesting for a stock market no, game. No in tr- insider trading <laughs> yeah. there. Like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so you really have to like think about when you really want to buy or sell a share. Also, another thing is companies start getting more expensive to maintain it, as time goes on. So you want to start closing them or you lose money. In Rolling Stock, there's a bunch of strategies. It's really open-ended. For example, one strategy is you can get a bunch of the early companies and have a mega corporation at the beginning that's really good, but then it won't last through the end of the game because all the companies are going to close down. Another strategy is you can never form a corporation and you just buy and sell private companies to other people, and then you get a lot of money that way. But yeah, the main thing is you want to have the right amount of money at the right time, so liquidity is super important because you want to invest in the future because it's like a stock market game. It's also extremely brutal, so like overbidding by one dollar can cost you the game. Oh wow. (laughs) But I really like it because I like how the different strategies are still competitive with each other because I've seen really close games that go back and forth each round and you're not sure who's gonna win at the end. And I also enjoy like planning the best companies to go into the corporations to get the best synergies. I like that part and 
it's a really economical engine building game, which I've said before, like that's my type of game. <laughs> so yeah, my, my husband Toby and I really like it. And my, my husband actually is making an online version. He talked to the designer who's helping him make an online version at rollingstock.net so you can try it out. Because um, the other way you can get it is it's sold at All Aboard Games, which is a publisher of 18xx games, but you can also do a PNP. Oh, and also the designer is coming out with a second edition, which will be less punishing and more streamlined because the first edition has a lot of math in it. And the second edition will also add some graphic design because if I don't know if you've seen my pictures on Twitter, but the first edition is uh, a little ugly. <laughs> <laughs> it uses like open source art for the company logos and stuff, and yeah, but but yeah, it's a really fun game. That's Rolling Stock. It sounds intense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can try it on RollingStock.net. <laughs> Good play. Yeah. I don't know about that one. <laughs> so is Maybe. the online version currently playable? Like, yeah, it yeah up? it's playable. And he's going to yeah. add the second edition, I think, eventually, but he doesn't have the rules for that yet. So you said, I think, if I remember at the beginning, you said it takes like three hours to play for your group. Mm-hmm. Um, does an online game take an equal amount of time or does it take less? Um, well, the online games you can play asynchronously. Oh, okay. So uh, it could take weeks. Right, but, obviously. But yeah, if you're playing real time, it could take less because there's less math. Or, I mean, there's the same amount of math, but the computer does it's it It's being for done you. for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Very that's cool. one of the few games where it's like more convenient for me to play it online because most of the time I don't like playing online games. I feel that way about um, Carcassonne because nobody likes to do the math for farms mm-hmm. at the end of that game. <laughs> so playing that online was always a lot easier for me. Yeah. I totally segued into a very weird place. <laughs> um, recently, I finally got to play Power Grid Deluxe. I've had this game on my shelf for about a year and a half. And I've been looking at it and looking at it and looking at it and going, I really want to play this. And finally, I found five other people who wanted to play it with me. Woohoo! Wow. And that was exciting. So Power Grid Deluxe is the 10th anniversary of the Power Grid game. They've updated some of the rules and some of the components and things like that. Um, Rio Grande published it in 2014. We play the full six players, which um, most people don't recommend. (laughs) I think it's recommended best with four. And it's about 120 minutes, maybe a little more if it's everybody's first time playing. I found the 120 minutes to be pretty, pretty true to gameplay so in power grid the goal is to be able to power as many cities as as you possibly can because at the end of the game whoever can power the most cities is going to win so you are using your money to bid on power plants and you can also so you bid on the power plants you can purchase resources for your power plants to actually utilize them to power your cities or you can buy cities so to buy the cities you have to buy the path to the city and the city itself each round you're going to get money based on how many cities you are able to power so you turn in the resources you use to power the cities and you get a bunch of money to use on the next rounds to do all the purchasing and auctioning and all that fun stuff that's literally the easiest way i can explain power grid without taking the entire 30 minutes. <laughs> Did you like it? I Oh yeah, I absolutely <laughs> loved it. We played we played um so the deluxe has a giant board and it's two-sided and it has a North America side and a Europe side. We played through the North America side and all of us, all six of us were like we need to play this again immediately right now. So we flipped it over and played the Europe side. Wow. And it, wow. it was awesome. Like I couldn't stop thinking about this game for weeks. It's all I wanted to play. Wow. That's, you're, you're actually kind of making me want to play Power Grid again. And that's... <laughs> Does it feel a lot different in the different maps? There were a couple of little, like, rules changes, mm-hmm. but it, it was, it still felt like the same game to me. It didn't feel, it didn't feel very, like, new or different mm-hmm. outside of the places you can go, obviously. I've said it before. It's been literally now 10 years 
since the last time I played Power Grid. And I just, it's, <laughs> it's such a classic that yeah. even though I know it's not really my type of game, I still kind of want to play it again because I want to know how the gamer I am today would like it. Because mm -hmm. the gamer I was 10 years ago is an entirely different person. So I don't know. I would, I'll probably, that's why I keep avoiding it. Cause I don't think I'm going to love it, but who knows? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, Cassidy, maybe you'll be able to talk me into it at some point. I was just going to say, is this another one we have to break out at MeepleCon? <laughs> We're just never going to play games with other people. We're just going to be playing games with <laughs> each other the entire time we're there. Well, we never get to play <laughs> games with each other. So. <laughs> I know. That's, I, I it kind of, I feel like it's okay if we, and you guys are going to enjoy playing games with some of my friends there too. Uh, I know we had talked about playing Battlestar Galactica and one of my friends in my game group, Gwen is she's like, Oh, I'm in. She's like, I've never played it before and I want to play it. So, and I'm actually going to, usually when I teach new players, I do not include expansion content, but I think I might go a little bit crazy with the expansion content just to make it really super fun. So we'll see how that goes. You know, I have one of the expansions for it and we've had it for like, I want to say three or four years and we haven't even broken it out of the shrink. That tends to happen though, I think, because if your game group is anything like mine, when you are teaching games to new players, every time you break them out, it usually is mm -hmm. good to start with the base game and Battlestar yeah. Galactica. It's not ridiculously complex, but it is, there's a lot going on. So for first time players, the base game is definitely a little easier. Yeah. I think Battlestar will be my next planned game night that I'll host. Because that's cool. what we did with Power Grid. I said, I'm inviting you guys over. We're playing Power <laughs> Grid. If you don't want to play Power Grid, let me know. I'll invite someone else. <laughs> so I think I'll do the same thing with BSG. That's smart. Well, a couple episodes ago, we discussed our favorite games of 2016 and clarified our statement with the fact that we hadn't played all of the games in 2016. And in between the time we recorded that episode and the time that that episode was released which wasn't that long. It was like, what, a week and a half, I think, uh, between yeah. our recording time and our release date. I played four <laughs> more games from 2016. <laughs> uh, we, I played Ice Cool, which we talked about in the last episode. Um, I played Mechs vs. Minions, which we had also mentioned, mm -hmm. um, but hadn't talked about yet. And then I played Kanagawa, which I will probably talk about at some point in the future. But the one I want to talk about today is Lotus, which is a card game published by Renegade Games in 2016 for two to four players. In Lotus, players each have a deck of petal cards with bugs of their specific color on them. And then there's a deck of community petal cards that don't have any bugs on them as well that players can draw from. Players take turns playing petals onto flowers on the table. Each type of flower has a different number of petals required to complete it. And uh, they're vying for control of the flowers with their bug symbols on their cards, as well as their little bug tokens that they have in front of them. When a player places the very last petal on a flower, that player takes all of the petal cards from the flower and puts them into their pile to be scored at the end of the game. And each petal is worth one point at the end of the game. But the player who is controlling the flower when it's completed, um, so that might not be the one who finished it, it could be another player, they get either five victory points or they get to claim one of their special ability tiles from the table. And the three different uh, abilities that they can claim will either increase their hand size, give them a more powerful bug token to use on future turns, or will let them play an unlimited number of petals on a single flower during an action on their turn. Normally you're limited to two petals per action and that will make it unlimited. So that can be really powerful. Play continues until one player draws the last card from their personal deck and the player with the most points wins. And if you have not seen this game in person or online yet, I strongly suggest that you Google it. It is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. And especially when like the flowers are all laid out on the table, I think it, it's hard to walk by this game and not immediately kind of be drawn to it because it's simplicity and it's the, the vibrant colors just absolutely are stunning. And the gameplay is beautiful as well. It's, um, it's easy to learn. It's a, it, I wouldn't classify it necessarily as a filler game as it takes a little while to play, maybe like 
I would say like 30, 45 minutes, but I definitely would put this in a gateway game category. Like it's, you could teach this to just about anyone and it's, it's cute. It's light. It comes in a somewhat small box for a card game. It's a little bigger than some, but not bad. And the artwork Isn't on the box. It's like, it's like the size of the munchkin box, right? Yeah. I think that's mm-hmm. probably a good comparison. Like I'm, I'm glancing over at my shelves. I could actually theoretically put, I have Munchkin Adventure Time. I could put Munchkin Adventure Time and Lotus next to one another, but eyeing them, (laughs) it looks like they are incredibly similar. So yeah, not tiny, Mm -hmm. but not huge by any means. Um, Each character is a different color and has a different type of bug. So like the green player is the caterpillars and I think the yellow or the blue player is the butterflies. Um, I would definitely recommend it. I think it's a wonderful game. And I played it the first time and then immediately ordered it and added it to my collection. So I've now played it a couple other times and I really like it. So that is Lotus from Renegade Games. You know, Renegade sort of killed it, at least for me, in 2016. Like, I haven't played Lotus, but I've looked at it a lot. And I'm (laughs) like, oh, I need to play this game because it's so pretty. But they did Clank and they did Apotheca both in 2016 and World's Fair. And I loved all of those games. So apparently so shout out to Renegade. Sort of like <laughs> yeah, they're uh, stepping up their game for sure. Oh, and then Lanterns, I think in 2015, which I own and adore. It's another oh, yeah. like Japanese. Um, I, for- I forgot that that was them too. I really like Lanterns as well. And I would say this is a similar weight to Lanterns in like yeah. gameplay style. Like it's not... Not, yeah, not, not too light, but definitely on the lighter end of the scale. So since Valentine's Day just passed, we kind of had two player games on the brain. Uh, but whether you have a significant other in your life or not, two player games are great to have because sometimes you have that awkward situation like in a game group where you've got just a few more people than would accommodate a specific game. And so it's nice to be able to break off into a group of two and play a really good game. So we're going to talk about some of our favorite options when it comes to two player games. So I tend to get to our um, weekly board game night pretty early, earlier than most people. And every once in a while, there will be another early bird so i i tend to keep um at least one or two two player games quick stuff on me just for that reason and one of the ones that gets played the most is called catamino it's a nice like wood component game that when you look at it it looks like you're playing tetris huh and uh when you play two player there's this like the like a tetris like board that you split in half and you each will take turns selecting your pieces and then the first person to fill in their side without any empty holes wins so it's a fun little like five minute game like i i can't even remember how many times i've played this like over and over and over just to kill some time that sounds really cool speaking of tetris like games another two-player game that looks kind of like tetris pieces is patchwork where you're making a quilt it's not very thematic though but but you move around pieces and you're buying these pieces with buttons and then and time and you put them on your board you don't have to fill up your board but you get negative points for not filling up your board yeah we talked about patchwork a little bit in the family game episode where my mom was a special guest Mm -hmm. and she liked the quilting theme so i feel like it doesn't it's not super thematic though (laughs) No, no not not enti- <laughs> not entirely. But hey, you yeah. know what? If the theme will draw somebody yeah. in, mm-hmm. that was how I roped her into playing it. <laughs> I play so much patchwork digitally. At least I mm-hmm. did for a while. I haven't in a while now, but I love love patchwork, mm-hmm. and that's why it gets recommended on the <laughs> Reddit all the time. Yeah, patchwork is my group's. Like somebody from my group always has patchwork around. So if we have a offshoot of two people that need a game to play that's a good one um i one of the other two player games that i love that i defer to uh often is uh jaipur um it's kind of a classic game now how what i don't remember what year it came out i'm gonna look it up real quick remember but um i feel like it's been around for uh, 2009 so it's now uh eight years old and in jaipur you are trading goods uh, back and forth 
between yourself and the community cards on the board to cre create sets. And the larger the sets you can make, the more points you get. And it's a best of three rounds kind of deal. It's really quick to play and it's pretty simple to teach. And the artwork on it is really pretty as well. So, and it's, the box is really small for as much game as, as is in there. So I, I love Jaipur. I, it's funny, I don't actually own a copy of the game though. Like I've played it a whole bunch of times. And I think that's one I probably need to add to my collection. Cause I really I do love it. I it. Yeah. Yeah, I actually bought a copy of it for my neighbors when they house sit for us once and they love it. So I've now purchased them Jaipur and Patchwork. Nice. <laughs> Join me in my hobby, neighbors. <laughs> I, uh, it's weird. I don't typically, like, we, we play two-player games at my game group, but, like, my husband and I don't typically play a lot of two-player games. I, uh, I mean, he plays Magic the Gathering, and I've played mm. that with him, so I guess that kind of counts. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, game. yeah there, there are formats of Magic that you can play multiplayer. Usually mm -hmm. Magic is meant to be played between two people, and uh, I am not good at it. He is very good at it, so we don't play often because <laughs> while I don't mind losing, losing all the time is slightly less fun, so. <laughs> I'm okay at it. One game I used to play a lot with my husband is Android Netrunner, which is a card game, a living card game from Fantasy Flight. It's two-player asymmetric card game. Basically, one person is a corporation and one person's a netrunner. A runner and they're trying to hack into the corporation but it's card driven it's kind of like magic the gathering in that there's a lot of cards and you build your own deck and we used to go to tournaments a lot too but we stopped playing because we stopped going to tournaments and then we got rid of our we got rid of our copy but that was really fun and i, I still think the game was really fun is really fun just it was a it took up a lot of time to play because we played it so much <laughs> I've been, I've never played Android Netrunner, but I've been interested in the newer um, LCG that just came out not too long ago. The, um, the Arkham Horror one? The Arkham Horror one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I've never played any LCGs before. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like, especially because my husband likes magic, that an LCG might be something that he would enjoy. So yeah. I've been considering buying the Arkham Horror LCG and playing through that with him. So if I do yeah. that, I'll let you know. But I know <laughs> that our friends over at Ding and Dent, uh, I know Raph is completely in love with that game. <laughs> and hearing him talk about it on recent episodes of Ding and Dent have, has definitely made me want to get it because he's <laughs> so excited and enthusiastic about it that it's kind of hard not to get excited about it. So, yeah, I love Netrunner. I got Netrunner thinking that I could get the boyfriend to play because he's a huge magic player. He refused to go anywhere near it. Aww. What? <laughs> Wait, did he not even play it once? No, not once. Oh, not once. That's sad. He, and this is why I have like this little like death corner of my board game shelf full of two player games just gathering dust because he, he swears that uh, two player games are boring. It's boring just playing a game with one other person. But he plays magic? But but he plays magic. <laughs> All the time. Well, <laughs> I, I'm lucky that my husband plays games with me a lot. So we have a lot of other uh, card-driven two-player games that we enjoy. Like there's Battle Con, Devastation of Indines, which is it's themed kind of like a Street Fighter type game. Two-player card game where you're these players fighting against each other. And then there's Baseball Highlights 2045, which is a deck builder where you're playing baseball against each other. <laughs> so those games are both pretty good. Stratego is the only one I can get him to play oh. frequently. That, that's a, I mean, Stratego, Stratego's while fun. being incredibly old now, is an awesome it's, game. Yeah, and it's a nostalgia game for him. Mm -hmm. He played it a lot when he was a kid, so that's why he still likes to play. I'm looking to see when it was originally published, and it was originally published in 1944. Wow. So <laughs> That's that awesome. Is, uh, yeah, but it's for people who haven't played Stratego before, it's interesting because uh, you've got all of your pieces on two sides of a board, but the identities of each piece are hidden to your opponent, and mm -hmm. they're trying to capture your flag, but you, they don't know where you placed it. 
and inevitably you usually placed your bomb right in front of the flag so (laughs) as soon as they find your bomb they find the flag yeah normally (laughs) i uh terrible terrible things when i was a kid i always tried to do the thing where i'm like oh i'll be clever and i'll put my flag in like the front row and hope and hope (laughs) that they go move it (laughs) right and hope that they go like to the other side but then inevitably they always find it so (laughs) <laughs> you know, because like it's the whole. They know that you're probably putting it in the back corner, so yeah. maybe put it somewhere else. But like everywhere else is a worse location. So <laughs> I um yeah no I like Stratego. I still own uh, well I don't still own the the copy that I had when I was a kid was a really old version of the game. I have one of the newer versions, but mm. that one's easy to find at you know like any store like Walmart yeah. or Target or whatever. For our etymology segment this week, I'm going to explore the history behind the word alliance. Originating in the 13th century, alliance meant bond of marriage between ruling houses or noble families, and came from the old French word, also alliance, but spelled a little differently, meaning a bond, marriage, or union. That word finds its roots in the older French word allier, pronunciation butchered as usual, but you get it meaning combine or unite. Both of the French words I just mentioned also have modern equivalents in modern day French that are still used, albeit with slightly different spellings. So while English borrowed this word from the French, it's still part of modern French as well. So this one definitely isn't as far from from its roots as some of the other words we've explored in this segment. So next time you try to form an alliance with someone, maybe your knowledge of the word's roots will help you on your quest. And that's it for this week's Board Game Blitz. Visit our website, BoardGameBlitz.com, to get links to all our social media pages, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Board Game Geek Guild. Our theme song was composed by Andrew Morrow, technical support provided by Toby Mao. Have suggestions for the show or just want to say hi? Shoot us an email at BoardGameBlitz at gmail.com. Until next time, we get by with a little blitz from our friends. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.